in the 16th official Bond movie, 007 was to come up against one of his most vicious opponents, a Latin American drugs lord called Sanchez. Now, the guy who played him was impressive enough, but he would have, as his henchman, a young actor who would become a leading Hollywood star. I'm Stephen Archibald, and welcome to my movie podcast. Welcome to They Came From Within, Cult Movie Reviews, Dramatic License, License to Kill, 1989. Timothy Dalton's second portrayal of James Bond was so tough, so intense, that License to Kill became the first movie in the franchise to receive a 15 certificate in the UK and a PG-13 in America. On screen, He would end up battered, bloodied and bruised like never before. And it's a rather unpleasant event which sparks off his personal vendetta. Bond and his buddy Felix Leiter, who now works with the Drug Enforcement Administration, capture the powerful drug baron, Franz Sanchez. On the day of Leiter's wedding, after being helped to escape the DEA's clutches, Sanchez carries out a brutal revenge on Leiter. Felix is fed to a tiger shark, but somehow survives. His poor wife Della suffers a worse fate. Desperate to avenge his friend, Bond refuses to accept reassignment to Istanbul. Consequently, he has his license to kill revoked, but this doesn't stop James from going rogue. He plans to nail Sanchez at all costs. The scene in which Bond offers to resign was filmed at Ernest Hemingway's home in Key West, which is why it's a literary in-joke when Bond tells his boss M, I guess this is a farewell to arms. The main villain, Fran Sanchez, was played by the oh-so-fearsome-looking Robert Darvey. It was said that he was brought to the producer, Albert R. Broccoli's attention, by his daughter Tina, and the scriptwriter, Richard Maybaum, was impressed by Darvey's performance in a TV movie called Terrorist on Trial, the United States vs. Salim Ajami. And Darvey's certainly one of the best villains in this cinematic series. There's a DEA character in this film, who opposes Bond's scheme to take out Sanchez. The agents, played by Grand L. Bush, whose previous role was in Die Hard, a movie which also provided Darvey with a high-profile part. In fact, the two men were teamed up as the FBI agents Johnson & Johnson in John McTiernan's rip-roaring action film. And sticking with Die Hard, it's very clear that License to Kill was heavily influenced by both this 1988 movie as well as Richard Donner's Lethal Weapon from 1987. Both were mega popular and both featured scenes of bone crunching violence. Another telling sign is that when John Barry had to retire from the franchise, After a throat operation, it was Michael Kamen who was chosen to do the score for this picture. And yes, it was Kamen who did the scores for both Die Hard and Lethal Weapon. It was actually Robert Darvey who stood in as James Bond for screen testing actresses up for the role of Lupe Lamora, Sanchez's mistress. Of the 12 women selected for the process, 
Robert chose the 21-year-old model Talisa Soto. He was clearly using some unorthodox scientific method when he declared she was picked because he'd kill for her. The movie's female co-lead, the DEA informant Pam Bouvier, was played by the lovely Carrie Lowell. Like Miss Soto, Carrie was a model turned actress. And both women were born in New York. Talisa Soto has been married to the actor Benjamin Bratt since 2002. And in a further twist, Carrie Lowell and Benjamin Bratt were two of the main stars of the original Law and Order TV series. This movie marked Dalton's second and last appearance as 007. However, the plan was for him to do more pictures in the franchise. Shooting was supposed to begin sometime in 1990 on an adaptation of the Ian Fleming short story, The Property of a Lady, from a script co-written by Michael G. Wilson and Alphonse Ruggiero. Unfortunately, the project suffered long delays due to legal issues with MGM. Exasperated by this rather lengthy hold-up, Dalton officially quit as Bond in April 1994. As all avid Bond fans know, the role of Sanchez's number one henchman, Dario, was played by an unknown Puerto Rican actor called Benicio del Toro. Benicio was only 21 at the time of making the movie, which makes him the youngest ever henchman in a Bond film to date. He did, of course, go on to star in such great films as The Usual Suspects, The Way of the Gun, Snatch, and 21 Grams. But even as early as in this role, his star quality shines through. He carries an air of menace that almost matches that of Darby, and that really is saying something. Licence to Kill did not just mark Timothy Dalton's departure from this espionage series. This was the last film the long-term scriptwriter Richard Maybaum worked on, and the final one which featured the title designs of Maurice Binder. Sadly, both men passed away in 1991. This movie also marked the last time Robert Brown got to portray M, and Caroline Bliss made her second and last appearance as his secretary, Miss Moneypenny. This was also John Glenn's fifth and final movie as director. I've loved watching the veteran actor Anthony Zerb since childhood, when I saw him play an eerie mutant cult leader in The Omega Man from 1971. Here he's just as chilling, portraying Milton Crest, one of Sanchez's cohorts. Written by Narada Michael Walden, Walter Afanasieff and Jeffrey Cohen, the glorious theme tune was sung by Gladys Knight. I think it's one of the strongest songs in the series. Even so, I'm intrigued to know what the original version sounded like, as it has been reported that the rock legend Eric Clapton cut a track with Vic Flick, the man who played lead guitar, on Monty Norman's celebrated James Bond theme. As with The Living Daylights, a second recording artist was brought in to perform a song on the closing credits. It's Patti LaBelle's If You Ask Me To, which was written by the great Diane Warren. Licence to Kill was the first Bond movie to be filmed 
completely outside of the United Kingdom being shot on American and Mexican locations. Filming took place between July and November 1988. Originally to be called License Revoked, it had its title changed after being made. The film received its London premiere on the 13th of June 1989 and went on release in the States the following month. License to Kill cost 32 million to make and took $156.1 million at the box office. Unfortunately, making it one of the least successful in the series. I happen to believe it's one of the best Bond movies of the franchise. At the very least worth seeing for the explosive oil tanker and epic punch-up at its finale. I'm Stephen Archibald and thank you very much for listening to my podcast They Came From Within Cult Movie Reviews. You can find all of my episodes on most podcast platforms. You can join my modest gang by following or subscribing. Take care and bye-bye.